What's up guys and welcome back to Wall Street Millennial. On this channel, we've seen many instances of rogue traders engaging in illegal behavior, racking up tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars of losses for other market participants. Sometimes, these rogue traders are institutions themselves, other times they are just individuals who think they have found the key to the market. But almost no one comes close to the case of Jerome Curviel, the famous French trader who made thousands of unauthorized trades for his employer. They say that he placed nearly $70 billion in trades on the company's accounts, going unnoticed until he had racked up losses of about $7 billion. But by then it was too late, and his employer, one of Europe's biggest banks, had to write off the unauthorized trades as pure losses. In this video, we'll go over the career of Jerome Curviel, and how he tricked a prestigious French investment bank into letting him lose almost $7 billion of their money. Jerome Curviel was born and raised in a working class family in France. He went to college at the University of Nantes, studying finance, and then went on to earn a master's degree in back office finance. He was a mediocre student, not especially strong, but not weak either. After graduating from his master's program, Curviel started to work at France's second largest bank, Société Générale, or SOCGEN for short. SOCGEN is the French equivalent of JP Morgan or Bank of America, providing all sorts of retail and investment banking services. At the time, it was the second largest bank in France, and remains one of the most significant investment banks in the world. Among other things, it engages in retail banking, private banking, asset management, and securities trading. When Jerome Curviel joined SOCGEN in 2000, he was assigned to a middle office job doing compliance work. He was in charge of helping with tasks such as verifying trades and making sure all the activities of the bank's front office traders were in accordance with government and company rules. Over the course of several years, he made a name for himself within the company's finance department and was eventually offered a position in a front office job in the securities trading business. He was put on the Delta One desk as a junior trader, where he traded things like equities and ETFs. In his new role, he was paid handsomely, but he had ambitions to grow his position within the company, as well as his take-home compensation. Starting just a year after he was put on the trading desks, Curviel started making certain trades that he was technically not allowed to place. In particular, he put on bigger and bigger trades that overstepped his authority as a junior trader. But for some time, nobody noticed, so throughout 2006, his trade just became bigger and bigger. By 2007, he was placing billion dollar trades that he would hold for just a few days, and then sell them just before a 3 day alert system that would notify higher ups that potentially risky positions were being placed. Throughout the later half of 2007, he was net short the market, betting that stocks would go down. Sure enough, Credit worries and the gradual unfolding of the great financial crisis rewarded his bearish trades. As the markets continued to go down in the second half of 2007, Curviel was emboldened to put on bigger and bigger bets, eventually placing tens of billions of dollars of SockGen's capital at risk with his trades. He used futures contracts to increase his leverage on his bets. Futures contracts are financial derivatives whereby a trader can get 100% of the exposure to a stock or other underlying security, but not have to put up the capital of actually buying that security. Using these derivatives, he was placing tens of billions of dollars of his company's money at risk, and it was working. By the beginning of 2008, the Dow Jones Industrial Average had fallen nearly 20% from its highs, netting SockGen more than a billion dollars in profits due to Curviel's trading. The only problem was that this was perhaps too much profit. Even Curviel didn't mean to make that much money with his rogue trading. So at some point in early 2008, he tried to dial back his trading profits so as to reduce the attention that he would be getting from the firm's compliance officers. But he had already racked up more than a billion dollars in profits on his account, so he placed a few trades to try to bring those profits down slightly. He was bearish on stocks, so he placed long bets on the market, planning to close them once his account's profit had moderated. Unfortunately, the market crash only accelerated in 2008, dropping even more than in 2007. In a single day, the Dow crashed 778 points, the largest point decline in Dow history up until that point. The S&P 500 index dropped 8.8% in a single day, and the Nasdaq fell 9.1%. By the time the smoke had cleared, the total losses to the bank came up to more than $7 billion. This loss was a significant portion of the entire value of the bank at the time, something like 10% of the market cap. Along with accelerating credit losses of $3 billion at the same time, the bank was forced to try to raise new outside capital from investors. Curviel's supervisors were all fired, and Curviel himself was taken into police custody. After 48 hours of police questioning,
Curviel was charged with abusive confidence and illegal access to computers. Two and a half years later, his trial found him guilty of the charges and he was sentenced to five years in prison in order to pay back Sokjin $6.7 billion for the trading losses. However, that $6.7 billion penalty to an individual was considered to be a joke, and no one, including Sokjin itself, ever expected Curviel to pay back anything. But questions still remained about how the fiasco was even allowed to happen in the first place. Critics of Sokjin questioned whether it was even possible for the bank to have not known about his trading, given the extreme nature of the positions that he put on. Later in 2008, the French finance minister, Christine Lagarde, spearheaded a campaign to investigate the bank's involvement in making the fraud possible. She concluded that Sokjin had failed to apply the appropriate controls on Curviel. Only a couple years before the incident, Sokjin was told to strengthen their operational security protocols, but they did not. A potential reason why Sokjin may have knowingly allowed Curviel to place the outsized trades was because Sokjin itself was the one benefiting when the trades were going well, not Curviel. His trades had resulted in more than a billion dollars of profits for the bank before it all unraveled. Sokjin said that Curviel hid his activities by telling company authorities that large trades were mistakes, and then closing them just to put on similar positions in highly correlated trades later. Among other things, he allegedly also faked emails to his superiors in order to shift the focus away from himself. However, certain experts have cast doubt on whether these measures would have been enough to hide the trades from Curviel's supervisors. In particular, Curviel's lawyers have said that Sokjin knew about the trades all along and allowed them. They said that Sokjin was trying to use Curviel as a scapegoat to detract attention away from their own corporate losses from around the same time. Another kink in the story is that to this day, no motive for Curviel taking such large positions has been found. He would not profit from the trading gains. His superiors, on the other hand, would be likely to receive extraordinarily high bonuses on good trading results in Sokjin's trading operations. This could have incentivized them to either allow or possibly even encourage Curviel to make the risky trades after they realized that they were so profitable. After the fraud was uncovered, police investigated whether or not Curviel had accomplices that might have been involved in insider trading of Sokjin's shares around the time that the massive losses were announced. However, no such evidence was ever found. In the end, Curviel spent just five months in prison, along with the $7 billion restitution that he was ordered to pay back to Sokjin. These days, he is out of prison and is working another normal job just like a normal citizen. In the case of Jerome Curviel, it's hard to believe that he alone is responsible for the $7 billion in losses incurred by his employer. After making more than a billion dollars of trading profits in 2007, it seems implausible for Sokjin not to have looked into how the money was made. A billion dollars would have been a very significant fraction of the entire company's profits, let alone the profits of the securities trading division or even one single trader. The idea that he was working alone, without knowledge of his superiors until a massive position worth tens of billions of dollars came crashing down, seems absurd. It would be much more believable that others within Sokjin's trading division were condoning or even coordinating the trades and simply using Curviel as the face of their activities in case a disaster like this happened. After all, the potential motives in the form of bonuses for the leadership within Sokjin would have been millions or tens of millions of dollars, orders of magnitude more than Curviel's maximum potential compensation for the trades. But what do you guys think? Do you think Curviel is to blame for Sokjin's $7 billion trading disaster? Let us know in the comments section below. Also, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for future videos like this one. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Wall Street Millennial, signing out.